to the Tell Me More About podcast where we dig a little bit deeper into this weekend's past sermon and talk a little bit about how the content all came together. And I am here with Pastor Whit George. Hey. Hey. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Um, this was a this was a big weekend for our church for a couple of reasons. We we did something a little bit different on Saturday, mm-hmm. and uh, we canceled our Saturday night services. And then, do you want to talk a little bit about what we actually did on Saturday? Sure. Yeah, we we served in our community, which is uh, something that we do on a regular basis, but do in a kind of concerted, mm-hmm. more focused way once a year on uh, a day we just call it Love Day. We call it Love Day, and we just go out into the community yeah. and we sweat. Yeah, <laughs> we do. I mean, it's very <laughs> in July. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, I think it it built on the belief that Tulsa should be a better place because we're here. Mm. Um, And so, yeah, we we cleaned up parks, we served at different charities, served the homeless, um, handed out, I think, backpacks to kids in need, that kind of thing. Do a a wide variety of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many people served. I know just at Tulsa, the Tulsa location alone, we had like 1,500 people out serving. So... um, yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. It was, it's, a, it's a great day. That is amazing. So it was fun. Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. And I like the way that it actually partners with the sermon content from this weekend mm. because we talked about justice. Right. Yeah. So uh, because Proverbs has a lot to say. It does. About justice. Yeah. Um, which is interesting. But when you were putting together this weekend's sermon, mm-hmm. was it difficult? How, how was that for you? Well, um, you know, actually, strangely and surprisingly, it was one of the easiest sermons I've had to write in a Mm. long time. (laughs) It was nice. I was like, thank you. Um, (laughs) Because, uh, you know, we were working on uh, what what we're going to teach this fall, uh, spent three days of which you're a part of, um, you know, studying what we're going to be talking about. I'll leave that as a mystery for now. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. We, but yeah. We might talk about it a little bit. I don't know. How I, say, I don't think we've said anything. We, we haven't said anything. Oh, but we might talk. We might. Okay, well, we'll I see. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but just sort of diving into um, kind of where we're going this fall in a really focused way. I mean, like literally, you know, nine to five kind of thing, like all day mm-hmm. studying through some stuff. Yeah, it was a lot. For three straight days, yeah. which means I didn't get the normal kind of sermon preparation time I might, you know, otherwise get. So I was a little nervous about that, but um, but yeah, an outline kind of came together pretty quickly, and I, I, you know, I found that there was a lot to say, so it, it wasn't hard to kind of populate the, um, the sort of categories of thought that we ended up uh, mm-hmm. wanting to talk about this weekend. For anyone who might have missed it this weekend, you broke up the content into those three headings. Can you just quickly summarize yeah. what those were? Yeah. So I, I talk about the source of justice, the responsibility of justice, or you could say to justice, like the responsibility to do justice. And then thirdly, the promise of justice. So kind of looking forward to the future. So talking firstly about the origin or the source where justice comes from, that basically the premise that justice flows from God uh, because any other justice is really just a pseudo-justice because there can be no... If there's no law giver, then there's no real law. Mm -hmm. So anything that we say is justice is really just a sort of... Con- concept of justice, but not really a thing in and of itself. It's the it's the idea of transcendence. If, in other words, if there is no God, then really nothing lasts beyond the the the, the, the natural world or our 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 sort of temporal existence. Mm-hmm. So, love, uh, justice, morality these are all these are all just sort of maybe. You could say utilitarian concepts that kind of keep us from destroying one another, and that to that degree they're handy, but they have no uh, real meaning. Beauty would fall into that category mm-hmm. as well. So there's nothing that lasts or goes beyond the, the, your 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 because because you know when the sun burns out and we all die, what what does it matter? What was just and mm-hmm. or, or or right or wrong? There, mm-hmm. There's nothing. But if there is a God, then there's then that means so you could say then there's a lawgiver, then there is a law, and that law would be then universal, and therefore justice would be basically aligning the world uh, in 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 harmony with with the law of God. 
Um, yeah. Would so, you yeah. would you say that is like a definition of oh, justice, gosh. or how would you how, <laughs> I how would thought, you I'm define a, I haven't justice? Said, yeah, I mean, it's it's it, yeah, partly sure. There, there's there's probably better definitions, but yeah. I mean, I, and I didn't come into this thinking, oh yeah, like like with a uh, on the ready definition of justice, but yeah. sure, yeah, I mean. If God's the source of justice, then 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 the idea would be whatever He decrees as just is yeah. is just, and so to the degree uh, with which we're aligned to that would be the degree to which we're enacting yeah, justice. It's, there is this idea that God created humanity, and so wisdom comes from Him, right. and therefore justice comes from Him, and the right. understanding of what's right and wrong, and wisdom comes from God. It's not this kind of black and white or proverbs isn't black and white it's very situational when sure it, when it comes down to right. it so and nuanced yeah we need for sure some someone outside of us to right. kind of help guide us to understand what does it mean to be just what does justice look like and i think you could really ground that in the imago day mm. um in mm. that we're all created in god's image mm. and therefore have this equity of standing before mm. God. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Human rights. Okay. Yeah. 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 So therefore justice is acknowledging that that equity or that image bearing sure. quality in all of humanity. And so mm-hmm. when there's <laughs> what? Well, I don't Keep know. Going. When Keep there's going. when there's like a discrepancy there, mm-hmm. how does how what's our responsibility to right. To rectify that or to right size that. So So I, I think one of the interesting interesting thoughts on justice is that so if God's the source of justice then the idea is and I think I think there's a pretty good social historical case though I'm no expert on this but it you know people like Tom Holland who who is an expert on mm. this could mm-hmm. would would basically say that that the that the justice of or the 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 equity or any equity that we experience in say like w- the western world is 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 rooted in built on a judeo christian mm-hmm. concept of human rights and so forth you're you're talking about so not the not the actor not the actor tom holland <laughs> yeah not okay. spider man uh, there's yeah. an author he's a historian I, okay. I i'm not i'm not like deeply i own a, a a couple of books by him um but uh really yeah but not um I don't know a ton about him. <laughs> Basically, that's what I'm trying We're to really say. We're hel- a really helpful thinker, yeah. historian. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Basically, his his point in his book Dominion is that that's where the, the sort of the morality of the West and the things that you know, individual freedom, mm-hmm. the sovereignty, the value of the individual, human rights, all those types of things, come from and are rooted in historic Christianity. And so, uh, I, my point being is that if, if justice then comes from God, then then you can you can make a decent case historically and socially that like you can see that throughout history, um, you can see the countries, the, the places, the parts of the world that have embraced mm. uh, a, a Christian uh, ethic um, have become more just. Generally, this is not to say that they're without. You know, there's there's never been Christian genocide. Surely there has. I mean, you could point to the Crusades and other things, but 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 and, and so there's there's lots of there's lots of flaws and 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 bad things done by by people who who call yeah. themselves Christian. Yeah, in Yet, the name of Christianity. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Mm-hmm. Yet in general, mm-hmm. you would say that that the, the parts of the world most deeply impacted by Christianity are also the parts of the world that. Happen to also be the most the most just and generally probably I guess you could say egalitarian mm-hmm. or equitable. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that's the idea of the source of justice. The second one is just the responsibility to do justice. So if God being the the sort of if justice let's say flows down from God, then and and, and this is you know you know this already, but you know all through the Old Testament is a huge theme you could say of God being really frustrated with his people for not doing justice, mm-hmm. not caring for the poor, the widow, the mm-hmm. orphan, the mm-hmm. foreigner, so forth. Uh and 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 Christ has a lot to say about that too. Who's my neighbor? And then he goes in this whole thing about the the, the Good Samaritan. Uh that doesn't stop with Christ. It it echoes through, reverberates through the epistles as well. Uh what is it in Acts 15? Um, where they're like, hey, what do we need to require of um, 
of these new Gentile converts. To, they're coming mm-hmm. in with all these pagan practices. They mm-hmm. give a list of things, and then they're just like, and also make sure you know you don't neglect the poor. Mm-hmm. And then they say the very thing we were eager to do. You yeah, know? it's like there's yeah. this it's like natural it's charity. In. Yeah, that's yeah. just kind of goes with the territory. Mm-hmm. And of course, if you read uh, early church history, you can read about plagues that swept th- swept through cities, people dying, people abandoning the, uh, the, the city because of the plague coming through. And then Christians, rather than leaving the city, pressing in, caring for the sick and dying, knowing that they would k- likely catch the disease and die themselves, and many of them did. Yeah. Um, and, and so, th- you know, things like that, the, the, the remarkable way in which they shared their their resources, uh, all of those things. So, uh, the, you know, the hospitals that were set up. I mean, there's 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 a there's a lot of good. There's a lot of bad, but there's a lot of good. And I think what you see in all of that, just kind of historically speaking, and I don't know if there's any questions to this end, we can get into them. But what you see is like, is like you see in sort of Christianity as it applies, like sort of socially throughout the last, let's say, two thousand years, is like kind of this three steps forward, one step, two steps back kind of thing. You're you're moving forward, but you're also, you know, like mm-hmm. losing ground at the same time, mm-hmm. but still inching, kind of moving forward. And so over the, you know, the the course of a couple thousand years, like a lot of progress gets made, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of setbacks along the way too. Mm-hmm. And it seems that God, like he has been from the very beginning, is pretty patient with humanity to just sort of let us kind of fail forward. As it were, so uh, that's so. So, so then, there's a couple of thoughts on 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 the um, the responsibility of justice. We could talk about that. Basically, it's kind of the compassion side and the judgment side of justice. I think both are needed. And then finally, the the promise of justice, which is really like a future looking forward kind of thing, where we're talking about sort of the promise of ultimate justice yet to come, hmm. um, a world made right, things fixed, not an escape from the earth for Christians, but a, a, a setting right of everything that's been broken here, which will include, <laughs> yeah, some, some, some things that we have a hard time thinking about, you know, judgment and a just God and all of those types of things, things that we don't often talk about, but that's part of the story, both Old and New Testament. So that's kind of a summary. Let's go back to this conversation a little bit about holding uh, compassion mm-hmm. and uh, justice. Or what? Okay, let's think about it this way: if you if you were to hold these two things, and Jesus, you mentioned Jesus, and Think him about grace and a truth. lot to say, <laughs> yeah, a lot to say about about justice, but also loving your enemies. Mm-hmm. And so when we talk about um, justice coming to the evildoer and mm-hmm. Jesus calling us to love our enemies. How mm-hmm. do we hold those two things in tension with each other? Well, I think what he's talking about there is not not taking vengeance upon people that have wronged you. And you know, if, I mean, if you live in a in a kind of a sort of a cycle of you hurt me, I'll hurt you. That's only going to escalate, and you can see how that's happened. You know, throughout. wars get started that way. Um, we provoke one another. Wars get started in my home that way. Mm. And then also thinking about that, just even in the context of of loving people who are persecuting you, they were living as a minority in that time of, and I don't mean racial minority so much as I mean a religious minority. And so so you're talking about living in a culture where you had a, a whole different, the power of Rome uh, and, they, and Rome was certainly powerful. You're talking about this tiny Jewish state that had no power over Rome whatsoever. You have, uh, you know, Roman soldiers who can command you to carry their pack a mile. Mm. And so, what Christ is advocating for here is not so much just laying down and letting everyone and anyone walk over you, let your abuser go free. It doesn't matter. I think what he's talking about here is that when you're being persecuted for your faith to some degree there is a there is a gracious response what I think it's a proverb actually uh, and I don't have it on recall but it's the idea of heaping burning coals into their lap it's like I'm not going to let you sort of disgrace shame humiliate me to the point where I'm just 
you know, angry, seething at you, but rather I'm going to take what you're intending for evil and I'm going to turn it around and actually serve you with it. Mm-hmm. And and so I, and I and I think it's a great thing. Um, and and I think some in some way the practice of that can be lived out in a home or in you know other relationships that y- you have. But I I think there's a a, a balance between loving people who are trying to take advantage of you not seeking to pay people back but also also not allowing people to just walk all over you all the time hmm. um and a longing for uh, real justice to be done because the same Jesus that said love your enemy said you know it would be better for you any of you who cause a little one to stumble would be better for you that you had a millstone hung about your neck and thrown into the sea <laughs> so there's there are quite harsh statements that he makes about judgment. Yeah. Um, so, so clearly there's a, there's a balance in, in all mm-hmm. of this. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think what, 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 it's interesting because what Jesus, how Jesus treated the Romans versus how he treated the Jews who crucified him was really different. Mm-hmm. He, had a, he had really harsh things to say. Like, you know, what is it, Matthew 23, the woes there? Woe to you, mm-hmm. woe to you, you, you whitewashed tomb. Mm-hmm. Like, he's really harsh there towards these people who should know better. And then to these Romans who don't know better, he's saying, Father, forgive them, they don't, they don't know what they're doing. Yeah. So I think maybe a good way to talk about it is the idea of restorative and retributive. That's right. There you go. Okay, that's a yeah. great way to say it. Restorative and retributive. Talk yeah. about that for a second. So just so retributive is the kind of like right. evil doers and yeah. you know like things like that, but then restorative is almost the Bible probably talks more about that and it has it this kind yeah. of redemptive edge yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the putting things back as they should have been all along. Yes. Regardless yeah. of whether or not I "Quote unquote," deserve it. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like that's the thing. It's like the the idea is not. And so this is the sort of the world that we're living in today. Is like, well, you're oppressed, therefore you, and you know, you're worthy. Like, and, and it's 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 mm-hmm. interesting. There there becomes like a worthiness, a greater mm-hmm. worthiness placed on people who have suffered more. And no mm-hmm. doubt, like when people have been oppressed to some degree. There is, I think, some measure of like respect. Yeah, and in, in, uh, in a certain level of responsibility that we would hold to a certain extent. Interesting. Well, so, so yeah. like, like, like you know, we were talking earlier before we started recording about like the Holocaust. Mm-hmm. Anyone that you know, to, I've never met a Holocaust survivor. To have mm-hmm. met one would be something to sit and have a conversation with them and talk about it, and it would, it would certainly be a respect mm-hmm. for you even surviving this, but. Yeah. To suffer, yeah, it's interesting, and I, I, I'd have to think about it for a while. But, but, but culturally, like we want to put this worthiness, this sort of righteousness, let's say, on on anyone who's suffered. But I think biblically, there's more a case for putting things right because. God, it's, it's what you're talking about, restorative. There's a standard. Yeah. Something's off. Something's not it's meeting that the mark. It's Imago Dei idea. Correct. Yeah. And so we're lifting someone up because God never intended for you to be in this place, mm-hmm. never never intended for you to be trampled like this. This mm-hmm. is not part of his good design and creation. So we're trying to sort of level things out. Yeah. This is, I think, in part why Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done mm-hmm. on earth as it is in heaven. It's this... M- making things as they should be, and maybe even, maybe even, I'm I'm curious what you would think about this. But you know, some of the prophetic things written about Jesus, maybe maybe about Christ, or or it's about John the Baptist, but it's about making level. Mm, yeah, that's very the, interesting. The bringing down the mountains and raising up the valleys. Yeah, yeah. It's like about making level, and there is certainly that that you see in the ministry of mm-hmm. of Jesus, lifting up. Those who were who were way on the bottom and bringing down those who are way on the top. It's not a sort of communism like let's make everyone the same. No, and sort of flattening out of resource and and you know structure and, and all of it. I don't I don't see that, but I do. But 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 there is, but there is a sort of sort of shared communal responsibility that w- we have as well that yeah. maybe makes some of us, depending on where you land sort of on the political spectrum, a little bit more uncomfortable because we're sort of hyper-individualists, mm-hmm. right? So it ought to make you uncomfortable one side or the other. I mean, I mean there's going to be notions of personal responsibility that will make some folks uncomfortable and notions of communal responsibility that will make some other folks uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. It really does make me think about how God 
God is the source of everything that we have, really. So if you think about Abraham, Abraham was a rich dude, mm-hmm. but everybody around him benefited from the the prosperity that he experienced. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know. I just I'm thinking about how does how does that call us to be stewards of the things that God has given us Correct. in ways that are um that are uh have a redemptive yeah. edge to them. Absolutely. And so yeah. yeah, kind of having that mindset. So that was part of what we talked about this weekend and actually interestingly enough the one time in my life I did get to talk very briefly to Tim Keller was in a class I was in in New York City, and he was meant to be there in person. And because he was still at the time battling cancer, doctor recommended that he did not come in person. Mm. He uh, did a Zoom call with us and uh, gave us a little lecture. And then we had a little bit of Q&A. And so I got to ask one question, and it was actually around justice. I was asking, particularly as it relates to kind of the gospel and, and, and to what degree are some of these restorative qualities a part of the gospel? And so one of the things that he talked about was actually referencing a verse that I used this weekend, which was, I think, Leviticus 22, 23. Do not glean your field, or do not harvest your field to the edge, uh, and do not pick up the gleaning. So the idea he was, the point he was making is exactly the, I just used his point, which is basically not living your life all the way to the edge, not spending everything you have on yourself or not maximizing every deal you have, Hmm. if you're a business owner, to your own advantage because you could exact a lower price out of a, out of a, um, a, a contractor because you hold all the leverage in the sort of business relationship. You don't because you want to see them make money too. Mm -hmm. So you're in it for everyone Mm -hmm. rather than just in it for yourself. Sort of striking a blow at a kind of hyper-capitalist sort of mindset that would basically tell me, get everything I can for myself and hoard it all up. Uh, I I, I think the opposite side is is also like, like taking it the other direction, which is let's strip away from people what they have and give it to like the sort of Robin Hood kind of idea. I, I'm, I'm not for that either. But I think I think gospel justice looks like uh, a, a real generous mm-hmm. uh, a, a approach to life, believing that God is big enough to bless yeah, it is that here. open-handedness, Correct. knowing that, again, God is like, if we thought of him as like a generous host, like he's yeah. created the world yeah. and he's He's like just, I don't know, he has more than enough. It's kind of living with the mindset of like, there's more where that came from. Oh, for I've sure. Got, I'm, I don't have to hold on to everything yeah. because yeah. there's more where that came from. And <laughs> what's really amazing is that when you live in that way, God yeah. blesses totally you. Does more than you could possibly for sure imagine which is very cool yeah yeah so um you talked to this weekend also about like a country that is close to mm-hmm. god typically is more just and yeah so i want to clarify yeah i want to clarify okay. that because um yeah so so I, I, i'm trying not to make delineations between like christian and non-christian nations mm-hmm. what i would say are are nations that have been impacted by Christianity to the degree that the gospel penetrated a certain part of the world, then you could say those nations were more impacted by Christian thought and morals and and values or views of justice, um, and and so, and you can see that across the like the West. So again, the value for human rights, women's rights, individual rights, mm-hmm. all of these things are though we may deny God on a sort of broad, let's say, secular basis uh, uh, sort of scope today. Um, uh, Publicly, politically, we we sort of want to keep all that out of the equation. What Tom Holland would say is that you can't deny that, like, that the framework that you're standing on, the very ground that you're standing on, was formed and forged by Christian thought. It was not paganism that came to the conclusion that every human being has dignity and worth, Mm -hmm. which would then, I mean, that one idea, just that one idea, which is a uniquely uh, Christian idea, Judeo-Christian idea, that one idea has, when you think about how much of 
just American civilization, but let's even go to European civilization as well, how much of what we believe to be true about the world, the fact that we value human life over an animal life is... Like you, you just take that for granted. You just assume that that's true. Mm-hmm. When, from a biological, like a like a like a purely bio or evolutionary biological perspective, you have no basis to believe that. Right. And anyone yeah. that's actually really been honest with themselves, w- w- they admit that. They talk about that. Like like really, there's there's more. I, I read somewhere. I can't remember where. A book that I read of uh, anyway of uh, some some guy talking about like truthfully there's more value in like the life of a baby pig than there is in a baby human, but 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 mm-hmm. but when you're thinking of it purely from a like a like an evolutionary bio- biological standpoint, we we need less humans on the planet, not more. And by the way, you can kind of feel that when you go to certain parts of the world, like mm-hmm. in certain parts of the United States. I've been where it's like kids are kind of looked at like, why do you have you know if I have five kids, why do you have so many? So anyway, you can kind of see that huh. sort of outflow. But point being that we're Christian, that the whole notion of human rights, I mean, that, that's affected everything. And we just take that as obvious. And yet it, it's not actually historically obvious. Yeah. Um, it was Christianity that brought that to the world on a large scale, changed the world in, in, in so many ways. And so I think there, there's a great line, I didn't use it, but Tom Holland essentially said, in the same way that, like, let's say, the bishop of whatever, Canterbury, refuses to admit that he might have descended from an ape, so too whomever the basically refuses to believe that they their beliefs about the world may have descend have definitely descended from mm. from Christian thought. Hmm. And that's fascinating. So yeah, yeah he, he's just because he's not a he's not, he's not a Christian. He's no believer, but he's but he recognizes historically the deep impact. So my point being is that where those thoughts about human rights, human dignity, all of that type stuff, where that has taken root in the world. You will generally, by and large, see a a a more uh, just kind of society that values human life, uh, women's rights. You could go beyond that, right? And yeah, in, in in ways that they don't in other parts of the world. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that if you look at any Western country and plumb the depths of its history, that you're not going to find find genocide or horrible things. Like the Holocaust is an example of this. Germany has been deeply affected by Christianity in its history. Luther was from there, but you know, still capable of what they did do. That does mm-hmm. so. It's so. It's not in a, uh, to say, yeah, you would never do that. But in general, what you find is a different sort of morality yeah. and value for humanity than you would find in places where they had not been affected by Christian thought and belief. You also mentioned this weekend, you talked a little bit about, in regards to value in human life, you you talked about the issue of abortion a little bit. Okay. And so, um, what does that look like? It's a, I mean, it's rife with tension. It's sure. It's not a, a sure. light topic. Even in, even in Christianity to some degree. Yeah. yeah. Like, if we're talking about the value for all human life, how do we care for yeah. people in a holistic kind of way? So I want to I want to just kind of preface all this by saying like th- this is not like my you know field of expertise or any of this mm-hmm. and I don't have like a well-rounded like some kind of platform about what I would do to sort of like how how the church should approach the topic of abortion um but just sort of riffing off of kind of um sort of the Christian idea of justice and how that impacts. Okay, so so one, what you're dealing with here is the tension, and it, it, it really goes through a lot of things. So the tension between the rights of the individual or the individual's desires or values and the communities. And that's it's an unsolvable tension. Mm. You're, you're not going to be able to say, this is what you should do in every situation. There's a, there's a, there's a nuance. Do you, do, do you follow what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. on one hand, you have the individual, what I want. Mm-hmm. And then you have, and what's good for what I perceive to be what's good for me. And then on the other hand, you have uh, what's best for the community. Let's take an example, like one that I sort of know of right now. 
family getting divorced, husband and wife. Um, from a biblical perspective, there are really clear grounds for divorce. We don't have that here. But you have two people who would say they're just deeply unhappy. Mm-hmm. There's the tension of what's best for me. I'm unhappy. I'm not enjoying this. And then there's what's best for, what about these kids? What about this extended family who's around this family? It's the tension between the individual Hmm. and the community. And you find that in all sorts of issues, particularly justice issues, you're you're, going to run into that tension and it's there biblically too. There's individual sovereignty. God made man and woman in his image. And then there's also communal responsibility. As you read like through the Old Testament, you you, you don't, or, or new for that matter, you don't read, I mean, Paul refers to himself openly without shame as a slave of Christ. Now, no one, no one's embroidering that on a pillow, to use a line from your sermon a couple of weeks ago, which I thought was so good. <laughs> um, no one's hanging that, you know, on their refrigerator. And yet Paul proudly thought of himself as a slave in full obedience to Christ, which is in so many ways a stripping away of your own individual rights and freedoms. I mean, the message of Jesus is, if any man would come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself, Mm -hmm. and follow me. So does this mean I lose my my autonomy, my personal preferences? Yes, no, right? There's a tension there. Even in my own career, I've had to live with this tension around the... the, um, the you know like like submitting to sort of the leading of the Lord the call of God where He's placed me and all of this and my own dreams desires and so forth. So there's a guy uh, Robert Bella I think wrote a book uh, talking about this. It's 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 a bit old. I have it at home. What does he call it? The the sovereign self I mm. think is the phrase he uses. Okay. So sovereign meaning I rule over all. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the that's the place that we're at. So what you're what you're living in now is a world where we almost can't we're we're individual we've swung so far to the individualistic mm-hmm. side mm-hmm. that we just can't fathom denying someone's individual sovereignty for the good of the whole. And so so what we've done is we've swung really far to the individual rights side mm-hmm. to the degree that we're willing to harm the community, the rest, everybody else so that I can fulfill, like live my truth, my own, my own reality. Abortion is, I think, part of that argument. Hmm. And, I, and I don't claim to have like all the nuance of this because one, I'm not a woman, I'm not, I've never been pregnant, I don't. So I, th- there's some of this I don't, the complexity of what goes on here, yeah. I, I'm, I'm only gonna wade into the water a little bit. But I would say ultimately what you're dealing with is is my own, you know, this is the whole idea of my body, but also you're carrying someone else. Mm-hmm. And so I think, like, biblically, I think the responsibility in that in that instance is to the innocent life. Mm-hmm. And you might say, well, what about, you know, extenuating circumstances? And I think that's probably a conversation to be had in a, like, with, you know, sit down with a pastor and really think through the, the morality of that. Mm-hmm. When you're in difficult situations like that, moral choices become, uh, they become, they're, they're not as clear cut as sometimes we would like for them to be. And so mm-hmm. those are things that should be worked through. And at least in a Christian context, with wise counsel, that sort of thing. But, yeah. uh, but, I, but, but what, I hope what I'm saying is coming across clearly here that there's the individual yeah. desire and there's the, there's the, communal obligation, which would be to fulfill your duty regardless of your preference. Yeah. And like, I mean, again, going back to like just World War II era, wildly different thoughts about that than we are living in today. P- people willing to sublimate their own desires for the good of the whole. Today, n- no way. I'm not laying down my desire. Mm-hmm. Why should I? Actually, right? here, yeah, here in the West, but like 
I would say in a country like Australia, that is still the kind of order of the day is this community willing to kind of buckle down. And you see this through. You're talking about like COVID? Yeah, COVID. Like but what's just, fascinating about all that too is that, it, so it's, it's interesting because, because this is where I think you could say on both sides, you could actually say, well, Christians, but you don't care for the community like you should, hmm. like you claim to want to do. Hmm. And then, and then you could look at, you know, people on the sort of, I don't know how I would even describe, let's just say the the left, and you would say, but you're oppressing individual freedom, the same sort of my body, my choice mm. logic doesn't apply to the whole vaccine argument. That's that's yeah. fascinating, right? So like, you're going to mandate that, but you want me to have freedom yeah. of it. There, so there's a lot of hypocrisy so, around yeah. all of this. I am not, I am not here to like go down a checklist and go, let's just like pick a side either of those right. necessarily right now. What I would say is that I'm describing the tension between mm -hmm. the individual and the community. Mm -hmm. And I think biblically speaking, it's totally there. And you have to, you have to, that's why I think you need wisdom. That's why justice is paired with wisdom because these two things have to be, they have to go hand in hand. For sure. Yeah. yeah. So, And I also think that justice can't be done at a distance. Mm. And so if we want to have these really nuanced, important conversations with people who are in the middle of really hard hard situations, mm -hmm. then we have to be in relationship. Like yeah. we can't right. we can't make the decisions in isolation from the people who are experiencing yeah, the sure. hardship or the suffering right. or whatever it is. And so and I think that the I mean obviously the New Testament has and and the entire biblical story is about the restoration of not just individuals, mm -hmm. but the restoration of a community. Mm -hmm. And that means we we live together. That's the idea of righteousness, mm -hmm. that restoration of rel relationship on, right. on all levels For between sure. us and God and us and one another. So, right. yeah. You, yeah. I think you might end up making right. The statement could be right. Like the the ruling, let's say, mm -hmm. could be correct, mm -hmm. principally, but personally and experientially, be there could be a massive gap, mm. and I think that's where Christians have been poor. We've not done a great job of advocating for what we believe, but doing so within relationship with the community. I think I ought to be able to have some different beliefs about gender, sexuality. All, all, all manner of issues than than the people like than than any like I think I ought to be able to have some some different views and us to to not hate one another, but I and I think it's it's all about how we do that. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's some people you can't please. I think I, I totally think that way. I think that's true. But I think also Christians find themselves in a lot of arguments they don't need to be in, or maybe they've stirred it up in a way that because they think they're doing justice by speaking harshly mm -hmm. and they would do better to enter into a conversation, mm -hmm. build some relationship before trying to smack people down mm -hmm. on social media or in public or at the workplace or wherever, mm -hmm. which doesn't feel like love. It just feels like, you know, just harsh judgment. It's the, it's the um, chart. What? What yeah, bully. It? Yeah, the the bully or the troll. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where mm -hmm. there's just there, but it is that distance from a distance. Yeah, I, I'm. Yeah. Hmm. I think I'm doing justice, but I'm actually protecting myself. And so I think when we think about yeah, justice, when you sure. think about somebody running towards the danger or moving towards somebody who's who is in a vulnerable situation, you really are putting yourself in a disadvantaged place. Mm. You are putting yourself at risk for the sake of another person. And so that's just very interesting to think about justice in those in those terms. Yeah, I, I think about it. I heard a friend say this years ago that you know sometimes when you're trying to gain access to someone's heart, I don't mean sort of like a love relationship, though maybe that could apply. But that it's it's like 
you know, you're not just walking across a room and opening up a door and entering their heart, but that you're walking across, you know, those those lasers that are invisible, oh, you know, someone's yeah. trying to break into a vault and and there's um yeah, and it's like you got to go on the floor and up this way and around that way and, and if you trip any of those, it's going to set off the alarm. Yeah. And I think a lot of times it's like when we don't have relationship with people um and we just kind of come blasting through that room and go over to the vault of their heart to try to enter in the code or drill a hole in it and blast the door open, whatever. It's like, we're, we're not really gaining access to what we're hoping to gain access to. Mm. We're just, we're setting off all sorts of alarms. And so their defenses go up mm-hmm. and they don't really hear what you're trying to say because you never, well, you never heard what they were trying to say. And so often listening kind of opens that door and uh, and questions can open that door. And then, you know, you build enough relationship. I think you gain the right to say harder things to people, things yeah. that maybe where you disagree. And they can hear it because they know that you care about them. If you were talking to somebody who is just kind of, you know, they're, they're going about their day-to-day life, and they heard the sermon this weekend, mm-hmm. and they're recognizing, like, okay, I want to be a person of justice. I want to, I want to engage in what it would mean to, if I wanted to do justice, if mm-hmm. I want to love mercy, do justice, walk humbly with my God, like the Micah Micah six eight. Um, what does that look like practically? Get into the Lord. As much as you can, I would not recommend starting with books, reading about justice as much as you can. It says Proverbs two: For the Lord gives wisdom, and then from that, then you will know righteousness and justice, equity, every good path. The the more I understand who God is, the deeper I go into relationship with Him, the wiser I become, and the more just I will be. And I, I, I'm not saying never read a book on justice. I'm saying to start there is to risk becoming, I would say, po- culturally polluted with whatever our views of justice are yeah. these days. And that is such a hot, they're and all over the place. And there's a wide exactly. range of You'll spectrum. end up in either ditch and yeah. you'll end up basically reading into the Bible your ideas of what justice are, not letting God tell you what it is. So I, I would really not even focus on becoming a just person. Hmm. I would focus on becoming a wise person. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mm-hmm. I would start there. So for me, I would go, well, that might be, I just, I wouldn't even make that a goal. It's a secondary. It's like my dad used to give this example. It's like sweat. I sweat when I go to the gym, I work out, but I don't go to the gym to sweat. <laughs> I don't go there and go, all right, let's sweat today. <laughs> I go there to work out. Sweat happens naturally. Hmm. The workout's the focus. Sweat's not the focus. Um, that, that I think, is the way that we think about justice. It's a secondary, even it's a secondary attribute of God. So God is just only to the degree that humanity is broken. There is mm-hmm. no need for God to be just in, in and of himself. The, the way you think about this is if you go all the way back before creation, when it's just God, Father, Son, Spirit, Justice is not one of his primary qualities because justice is about uh, f- fixing mm-hmm. restorative, retributive. Mm-hmm. What is there to restore? What is there? Where does there need to be retribution? There's perfection. Mm-hmm. So when you have perfection in a loving relationship, Father, Son, Spirit, there's no need for justice. Justice only becomes necessary once sin and brokenness enter into the world. So justice is a downstream attribute of God, necessary because there's sin, and interestingly, one day won't be necessary anymore, Mm -hmm. but for now it is, and so it's a secondary attribute. I think that's a great... Man, I wish I would have had time to teach that this weekend. I wanted to, but it just it didn't fit. But that that ought to be our our same approach. It's a secondary. It's a byproduct of getting closer to the Lord. I get closer yeah. to the Lord. I should become a more just person. Yeah, that would be my recommendation. Yeah, start there. Yeah, and if you see something that's not right that you can do something about, then do it. Sure, but Make I think right. that happens in you. Here's the thing: like when I look back on my own life. And I look at how I treated people and I looked at how I, I look at how I thought about people. 
when I started to experience a whole new relationship with Christ, 28, 29, 30 years old, I don't know, somewhere in there, my view of people changed and the way I spoke to them started to change. And it wasn't because I sat down and said, hmm, Mm. how can I be more compassionate? How do I become more loving? I just got, I saw who he was and I, in light of who he was and is, I started to realize, well, this won't do. Yeah. I can't talk to people. I can't treat people that way. What am I thinking? Why would I do that? I started, I started noticing people who weren't like me. I've told this story many times before, but traveling through the Denver airport one time, just a few years ago, and um, I'm in the Denver airport. I'm at McDonald's. I'm getting breakfast. I just happened to notice that everyone behind the counter is, is a minority. Uh, mm-hmm. Everyone on the other side of the counter being served is uh, is white, pretty much. And I, I don't think that's unjust. I just think it just is. But I do wonder what might that feel like to be all like you serve, we get served. And and so again, hear me like my answer is not let's tear down the system and make that not a, a thing. But I also think what would it then look like to sort of try to bridge that gap a little bit? So when mm-hmm. I show up to the to kind of the the um to order, uh, I'm making my order and I'm, I'm I'm I make a point to call this lady that is serving me by name mm-hmm. uh, to ask her how she's doing. Mm-hmm. These these are minor things, but just to treat someone like a human, just so that she knows I see you. Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not leaving like a like a pamphlet with her about how to receive Christ or trying to pray with her right there or any of that. I just she I recognize that this is someone made in the image of God. Mm-hmm. So so in what might could be a situation where maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a feeling of uh like like could feel somewhat, I don't want to say demeaning, but just um like a less than type sort of relationship. I mean, right in front of me, there was this like, and it's still there. You can see it. There's like a box that has like a smiley face and a frowny face on Mm. one end. And it was like rate, you know, in in different stages in between, it's like rate the service today. As you're standing there, like looking, like I could just push the button (laughs) right in front of her face. And so I'm thinking like, how can I, just what can I do to sort of humanize yeah. This person yeah. that I'm talking to. Giving, yeah, dignity and respect. I'm yeah. not I'm not I, I don't I don't go into that going, how can I be just today? Right. Let, let, let's do a good deed today. You know, I, I saw a video the other day of a like an influencer on a beach picking up trash and they're, you know, filming it and it's all this, and then they and then they just leave the trash behind after they're done filming. This is real. I was like, this is that that's that's our culture in mm-hmm. so many ways. It's like let's faint so all this yeah. virtue signal yeah, and faint all of this. More performative. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not trying to be or appear virtuous. I, I'm sitting here thinking this is a someone made in the image and likeness of God. I'm about to encounter. Mm-hmm. Let me treat them in a different way than just demanding. Yeah, I, I, I think about this in the service industry. I see this. This is one area where I think Christians could really. I guess I know some that's like I watch the way they treat people that come to work at their home. And I and I hear the you know, stories of like, well, I, I I you know told him off or this or that, and I'm like, I, I I get it. You have a right to expect work to be done well. You don't have a right to talk to people like they're nothing to you mm-hmm. just because you have money, just because you're the one in you know in a position of authority or power here, does not give you that right. Th- th- that's the kind of thing. I'm, so so to me, I'm, so what's the problem there? That person doesn't know Christ very well. That's the problem. It's not how to, like, let's be more just. It's You just need to know Jesus. He would never treat someone that way. Why are you? Hmm. It's, yeah, there's parables about this. Like, mm-hmm. you were forgiven a lot, then you go out and hold this dude that owes you five bucks accountable. What are you thinking? That's Jesus. And you're just like, yeah, that's basically... So when Christians do that, it's because they don't know. They've lost touch with their relationship with God, or maybe they never really had it to begin with. Start there. Yeah, that's the beginning of all of this. I, I yeah, uh, th- th- yeah. I think it's a really good point. Uh, something to talk about. I didn't get into this weekend. It's just that's the beginning of all of this. Is mm-hmm. don't I'm not beginning with justice in mind. I'm beginning with Jesus in mind, and then let the rest take care of itself. He will take care of it. I you will you will be changed. Yeah. 
so how do we reconcile the goodness of God with the injustice that we mm. see in the world? Oh, that's no big deal. <laughs> how easy is that? No one's... <laughs> yeah, okay. So, well, uh, yeah, I, I think the answer to that question is the, wrapped up in the theological idea of what's called the already but not yet. You mm. already know what this is, but mm -hmm. let, I'll explain it. It's that what God is doing, in a large sense, he has already done. So Christ, death on the cross, and subsequent resurrection means I can be reconciled to God and that sin is dealt with, I can be a new creation in Christ, all of these things, and yet I still live in a very broken world. Mm -hmm. So there is a second coming. Jesus came once, but he promised to come again, and the second coming is meant to bring a complete and total justice. So the period that we're living in now is what this in-between place of Christ having already come, but not yet come the second time. We're living in this, I would call it this period of, let's say, maybe, I would call it repentance, but it's, it's like this opportunity to, for repentance, right? It, yeah. It's like, hey, like God is prolonging judgment. Yeah. Yeah. He's holding out as long as he can. He's slow to anger. He's slow to anger, yeah. and he's going, look, I'm going to deal with this, and he's trying to help you see that, but it's only going to last so long. Mm -hmm. And so we're living in this in-between period where the world is not yet dealt with, where there are wars and evil and abuse and holocausts and wicked rulers and all of this, but there is coming a day... And here's the thing, you go, well, why doesn't God deal with that now? You underestimate the depths to which evil is in each one of us. And there are different, you know, there's different, <laughs> I think some of the people that get the most, like see this the most clearly, strangely, are comedians. Mm. Um, there is a, I don't necessarily recommend this, but there is a, like a 10 minute bit you can watch of, and I, I'm sure he's been canceled by now, of Daniel Tosh from several years ago talking about like the the sick, twisted thoughts that go through everyone's mind. And, and, and it's all kind of wrapped up in the, the, the point of like every time someone does a terrible thing, they interview their neighbors and they go, I never could have seen it coming. He's like, what are you talking about? He goes, I could see my mom doing, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. he, he says terrible things, but like, like push to the right degree the right way and he's not wrong like i think if you're really honest with yourself deep down there's you know in the right circumstances you're probably capable of far worse than what you think and so the, so what we want is god to deal with evil like in degrees like deal with what i would justify but not the source hmm. it's almost like dealing with with like like the like the symptoms of a disease, but not the disease itself. Like let's I don't want to feel bad. I don't want to be hurting anymore, but don't don't cut me open and take that thing out. And so if God is going to actually fully deal with evil, he has to go all the way to the root, which is going to going to mean that he's going to deal with it in all of us. And he's made provision for that by Christ coming and dying on the cross to pay for our sins, and yet he's being really patient and long suffering, allowing people to sort of to come to that conclusion, to let the gospel spread, to be preached, so mm -hmm. forth, and then the end will come, mm -hmm. scripture says. Mm -hmm. So there's coming a day where complete justice and on and when that happens, there's no more deciding. Yeah. Your chance for decision is over. So he's given you as long as he can. It was interesting, you know, we were as we were studying Revelation. You know, I thought one of the things that Dr. Vlachos, who was kind of walking through it with us, so he's a Wheaton professor, has taught Revelation for years, was talking about, I love this idea of like these, these things that are hitting the earth. And he's like, it's hitting the earth, but it's not hitting people yet. And he was talking about like the scene in these judgments, right? And he was talking about like a scene in, I don't know, it's in Back to the Future, you know, where you see probably Biff firing his gun at Michael J. Fox's feet in Back to the Future oh, yeah. 3, you remember? Mm, and it's like, yeah. dance, boy, uh -huh. dance. And yeah. So he starts moonwalking. It's a great yeah. scene. <laughs> so I'm threatening you, but I'm not hurting you. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Judgment's not hitting you yet. And it's meant to get your attention. It's like, that's, that's this period that we're in right now where God's saying, hey, wake up. And so the hope is that you will wake up and, and, and then one day justice will fully be done. Hmm. 
But when that day comes, it'll be too late for repentance. It'll be too late to change your mind. Sides will already have been taken, all of it. So, so God, is, God is patient in this season while we're waiting for perfect justice. So if you look around and you go, the world is still broken. Yes, it is. It won't always be. Yeah. That's the promise of justice coming one day in the future is he will make things right. Right.